We are doing a study in the Gospel of Mark. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. If you know Jesus well, it's going to enrich your faith. If you're just checking him out, seeking, wanting to know more about Jesus, you've come to the right place. Because we're going to talk about Jesus up close and personal. We're going to talk about what an amazing, he wasn't just a good teacher, wasn't just a good example. He is God revealed in the flesh. And we're learning about that, about what a wonderful person, the most unique person in the universe, Jesus is. We can see that today. And this morning, we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 6, which talks about what we can expect when we decide to follow Jesus, give our hearts to him, put our faith in him, and follow him. What can we expect? And before we get started in that, let's just play a game. And this game is really kind of, what do you expect? What can you expect? And I want to give you a couple of examples. What can you expect when you come to North Shore? For the first time, what can you expect? Well, hopefully you're going to be received with a warm welcome. You're going to be given an opportunity of a free latte or coffee and a freshly made cookie. That's what we do around here. You're going to be hopefully greeted by people. If you see someone around you you don't know, they may have been coming for years, but if they're new to you, make sure you greet them. That's part of the North Shore experience. That's we want to create a friendly atmosphere. But hopefully, you're, if you brought children or grandchildren, they're going to have a great time. We have a, you have the right to expect a great children's experience back in our education room. We also, you can expect uplifting worship, which is what we experience today. And you can expect an encouraging message from God's Word. These are just some of the things you can expect. Now, let me give you another scenario. What can you expect when you go to SeaTac Airport? How many of you have flown in the last year? Can I see? All right, we've got a lot of people who have experienced it, hopefully out of SeaTac. This is my home airport. I've been going there for virtually 60 years and have seen it, and it is a mess. What can you expect? Congestion. You can expect long, long lines through security. Good people are there. I mean, nothing against them. It's just they're overcrowded. You can expect construction everywhere. You can expect uh, confusion on what gates to go to. That happened to us. The, the cybersecurity shut down all their electronics. We had no way to know what gate we were supposed to go to except calling the, uh, the using your app to go to your airline and find out what gate. We had a Turkish airline plane come in and said, the Turkish airline from Turkey flew in. They said, folks, we're still waiting for a gate. We don't even know what gate we're supposed to go to. So it's crowded. It's congested. What can you expect? Well, you can expect uh, that crowded condition. Expect to wait a little bit. Now, that brings us today. What can you expect when you become a follower of Jesus? Well, you can expect God's blessing, of course. You can expect God's grace to help you, whatever you're going through. You can expect opposition, misunderstanding, even outright hate from those who disagree with you. You don't invite it, you don't want it, but it can come your way if you hold faithful to your convictions that you have about Jesus. What can you expect? You can expect the Holy Spirit's power. And all these expectations we're going to talk about in today's passage in Mark chapter 6 through three different scenes in this chapter, we're going to see basically what we can expect when we decide to go all in and follow Jesus with our lives. So let's look at it. What can we expect? Well, first of all, number one, we can expect opposition. You can expect to be misunderstood, maybe even from your own family. Jesus was misunderstood by his family, uh, by his neighbors, who he grew up with. We read about that here in verse 1 of chapter 6, that Jesus returns to his hometown of Nazareth where he grew up. He wasn't born in Nazareth. He was born, of course, in Bethlehem. Two years he went to Egypt with his parents, and then they came and settled in Nazareth. Nazareth is this little community in the Lake Galilee area. So here he is coming home now as the proclaimed Messiah, the Son of God, <clears throat> Notice the reception he received. Verse 1, Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. 
when the Sabbath, and you have to understand, the Sabbath for the Jewish people is Saturday. So when Saturday came, he began to teach in the synagogue. Synagogue simply means gathering place. It's where the Jewish people would gather on Saturday, their Sabbath, to worship God. And the many listeners were astonished, shocked actually, saying, where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him? And such miracles as these performed by his hands. These local yokos are shocked at the local boy who grew up. Who is this guy? They saw Jesus at work performing as the Son of God, the Messiah. They heard his teaching. They witnessed his command of the scriptures. They also witnessed his miracles of healing. They saw people who were maimed and injured and sick suddenly transformed and healed and restored. Wouldn't that convince them that Jesus was someone who was from God, someone unique, someone special? But these people couldn't get over the fact that they knew Jesus. They remember when he played in the streets. They saw him grow up. To them, to them, Jesus was always the carpenter's son. They remember him polishing furniture, nailing boards together. Nothing special. Jesus was just like them. Nobody's special. So notice their reaction in verse 3. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? We know them. We saw them being raised. The brother of James and Hoses and Judas and Simon. Are not his sisters here with us today? And they took offense at him. That's all you need to know about their reaction. Notice, they took offense at him. What did they take offense at? Why were they offended? Well, not because of his teaching, not because of his miracles, the people were healed and restored. What did they take offense at? The fact that he claimed to be the Son of God. It was his claim to be the Messiah, the chosen one, the anointed one, the one sent from God to be their Savior. They could not get over the fact that he was just a local boy. So they took offense at his claim of being from God. But look at his fruit. Look at the lives that were changed. Look at what he did. Look at his teaching that it burned in their hearts. People had been studying the scriptures all their lives and he was able to teach with such clarity and authority. It was almost like he was the author of those scriptures, which of course we know he was. But they couldn't get over it. There's a saying that I think is true for many. There are none so blind as those who refuse to see. Think about that. Their minds are already made up There's no way to convince them. There are none so blind as those who refuse to see. And that was the townspeople who knew Jesus there in Nazareth. He showed all the signs of being very special from God, of being that Messiah, the long-awaited one. They refused to believe it, refused to accept it. They were blinded by their familiarity with Jesus. They thought they knew him but they really didn't. They couldn't get past their prejudices. So Jesus says to them in verse 4, Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor. That's a double negative. What it means is a prophet has honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household, even amongst his own family. This statement anticipates Jesus' eventual rejection by his own people. Because the people of Nazareth would not believe in Jesus, would not accept him for who he was, Mark concludes this in verse 5, and he could do no miracles there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered, that is, literally was amazed at their unbelief. He marveled at their unbelief. This word is the sole use of this word in the gospel of Mark. It means strong amazement. He marveled. He was shocked by their reaction, their rejection of him. Even though the abundance evidence 
of miracles, of the teaching, was right there in front of them. They refused to see. They refused to accept it. This explains why Jesus didn't do many miracles in Nazareth. It's not because he lacked the ability. He's God, remember, in the flesh. He could do anything. It was because of their unbelief. And he didn't do more miracles because he knew that would only harden their unbelief. It reminds you of many in our society today. They refuse to see the abundant evidence that God is real. Think of creation all around us. Think of the beauty and the design, the intricacies, the complexity of our world. Look at a tree and think, that didn't just happen by chance. And yet, what does evolution teach? That life is a fluke, it happened by accident, and that macroevolution, we evolved, and all things by chance, blind chance, just happened to fall into place, and over millions of years, even billions of years, all the complexity and design today just happened. This is what is being taught. This is what is being taught in schools today. Macroevolution, that one species evolves into another, that we came from tadpoles and evolved slowly over time into monkeys and slowly over time to who we are today. That, they say, is science. Folks, I'm here to declare to you that is not science, that is fairyland. That is a fairy tale. Design demands a designer. Life doesn't come from nothing. It takes life to create life. Even the best minds, and I've read them, I've read the best scholarly works of how the origins were supposed to happen and could happen. They have no explanation. They even refer to life, the secularists do, as a fluke. They use the word as a miracle. They have no explanation. The evidence is there. Take your own eyeball, the complexity. It didn't just happen by chance and slow steps of evolution. Who is designing it? Who created it? It demands a creator. And yet the evidence is right there, but they refuse to see. And it's sad. It's sad how blinded people can become, how deceived they can become. Well, this is what we see here. So what can we expect When we hold true to Christ and stand firm in our faith convictions, opposition. Opposition. It happened in the first century. It's going to happen in the 21st century. Expect it. But rather than being intimidated by it, that opposition, we need to stand firm. We need to proclaim Jesus and continue to proclaim him with love, truth, and courage, and it takes courage to stand faithful. And in a world that's progressively going away from God, we who know God, we need to be a a loving, caring people, but we also need to stand strong with faith and courage. Amen, folks? It's going to require that, even more so. So Jesus experienced this opposition from his own town folk, the people who knew him. They refused to believe, just like there are people today Even with all the evidence, you're not going to be able to convince them on evidence alone. They refuse to believe. They refuse to believe in a creator. They refuse to believe in a savior. But we continue to love them. We continue to reach out to them. We don't give up on them because God can do miracles. And we need to continue to be a witness to them. So that brings us to the second thing we can expect. What else can we expect when we follow Jesus? We can expect divine provision. We can expect inner power, strength from the Holy Spirit on the inside to help us to face whatever we may have to face on the outside. If you're going through a difficult time, I don't know if it's a physical trial, you're going through a health issue, financial trial, maybe a relationship conflict, whatever you're going through, don't give up, don't despair, and don't get discouraged. God will give you the strength and the wisdom step by step and day by day. That's what God, the Holy Spirit, does. That's why Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit in us to give us that strength. And we see that inner provision, divine power, when Jesus sent out his disciples two by two. It's training time. You talk about discipling someone, mentoring someone. Jesus was a master at it. 
And so he took his 12 disciples and he's going to send them out in teams of two, two by two, to witness. And notice how he does it. This is incredible. We read in verse 7 of chapter 6 of Mark, and he, Jesus, summoned the 12 and began to send them out in pairs, two by two, and gave them authority over the unclean spirits, the demons. And he instructed them that they should take nothing for their journey except a mere staff. That means no bread, no bag for extra clothing, no money in their belt, but to wear sandals. And he added, do not put on two tunics. In other words, don't take extra clothing. And he said to them, wherever you enter a town, wherever that is, stay there until you leave town. Any place that does not receive you or listen to you, as you go out from there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet for a testimony against them. It was a sign of God's judgment is upon you. Verse 12, they went out and they preached that men should repent. Repent means get right with God. Turn your heart to God. Open your heart to God. Verse 13, and they were casting out many demons, not just a few, but many demons, and they were anointing with oil, many, not just a few, but many sick people, and healing them. What an exciting time this must have been, as they went out two by two, and totally depended on God. Can you imagine doing that today? Going on uh, an excursion where you take nothing but the clothes on your back, and you expect God to provide. You depend on Him to provide. Think about that experience. Trust, dependence on the Lord. There are some groups that still do this today. I don't know if you've ever heard of YWAM, Youth with a Mission. YWAM in their discipleship training will have a time where they will send people out two by two, just like it says here, with very virtually nothing but the clothes on their back and will go and minister and expect and depend on the Lord to provide. What a trust experience that would be. Now, we don't like that. We like to have lots of provision. We have lots of credit cards in our wallet. Uh, Let me give you an example of contrast. A few years ago, my boys and I went on a road trip. If you've ever done a road trip, you kind of have to plan ahead what you're going to take. We went around to the national parks. And so on this road trip, we took my pickup and we had not just one tent, two tents in case the first one failed. We had lawn chairs, we had ice chests, we had clothing in abundance, we had warm weather clothing, cold weather clothing, clothing for any occasion. If it rained, we were ready. We had food, enough to feed us for a month, and yet that's how we went out, fully provisioned. And you say, well, that sounds wise. Can you imagine going out and saying, okay, we're just going to depend on God and, and see how it goes? That's a scary. I'm not recommending that next road trip you take. But I am saying what an experience. And sometimes, and here's why God gives trials. If you're wondering right now, why am I having to go through what I'm going through? Why this? Why now? Why me? God wants sometimes to strip us of being in control of everything. Where all we have is God. And when God is all you have, folks, God is all you need. Amen? And that's what God wants to teach us at times. He puts us in circumstances beyond our control so that we will learn to depend on Him. And that's what Jesus is doing with His 12 disciples. It's a powerful lesson. So let me ask you, what do you need today? Maybe you need some encouragement. It's been a discouraging week. Maybe you need that inner peace that only the Holy Spirit can give. Whatever it is, depend on the Lord. Day by day, as that song says, day by day and moment by moment, with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I have no cause for worry or for fear. Sometimes God puts us in situations where we need to trust Him fully, and we will find Him fully faithful. Trust Him. So how did Jesus send His disciples out? I want to share with you three ways that he sent them out. Yes, first he sent them out two by two, but he sent them out with authority. Authority. Divine authority. In fact, with authority over the demons. Spiritual forces were no match. Never underestimate the spiritual power that we together have 
for God in this world. Not just you out there going off by yourself, but together, the power of the Holy Spirit, together working through us, what can happen? Jesus said, the gates of Hades will not prevail, will not be able to prevail when against us, when we're working and believing together and standing together. Together, we have the power through Jesus to cast demons out and to restore and heal broken lives. That's incredible power and authority that Jesus gives us. Second, Jesus sent them out with nothing but the clothes on their back. We've already commented on that. He did this so that they would learn to trust in God in everything, for everything. And that's a lesson that we continually need to learn. Rather than worry, trust in God to provide what you need when you need it. The best thing we can develop is God confidence. You'll never fear when you have a God confidence. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know God is good, God will provide, and I can trust in Him. And you have a peace, a calmness of soul that only the Holy Spirit can give. That's what He wants to develop in us. That's why He sends trials into our lives. Remember that. So what can we expect when we fully rely? He sent them also out with a message. The message was repent. Jesus sent them out with a message, repent. That means get right with God. Turn your heart to God. Turn away from your sins. Turn to God before it's too late. Folks, that's our message today. Jesus is coming soon. Get right. This is no time to walk away from God. This is time to receive Jesus into your life. So what can we expect when we fully rely on God? Well, we can expect lives are changed. Look at the fruit of what happened through the disciples when they went out two by two. Lives were changed. People were healed. And Satan was defeated. In a parallel passage in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, he says, Jesus, when they came back and told what had happened, Jesus said, I saw Satan falling like lightning from the sky. In other words, Satan being defeated. When we go in the power of the Holy Spirit together and working together, for the cause of Christ. This brings us to the third thing we can expect when we depend on Jesus. What can we depend or expect when we follow Jesus? Well, we can expect persecution. Sometimes that opposition, that disagreement, can even become overt and turn to violence. And this is John the Baptist's story. The third scene involves John the Baptist and what happened to him. In verses 14 through 29 in Mark chapter 6, Mark describes what happened to John, John the Baptist, because he would not turn a blind eye to blatant sin. Mark's gospel contains two passion scenes. The word passion here refers to a death scene. John's martyrdom and Jesus' martyrdom. Two death scenes or passion scenes are described in the Gospel of Mark. And Mark's martyrdom, or excuse me, John's martyrdom, looks ahead and prepares us for Jesus' martyrdom. Both John the Baptist and Jesus were victims of government persecution. Same kind of persecution, I think, that we are going to be seeing in the days ahead, even in our own country. Certainly others have experienced it in other places of the world. But we, I think, have to be ready to experience it even in our own. Which really is amazing. A country that was founded on religious freedom. People came from religious persecution in Europe, came to these shores, wanting to have a place to express their faith without government persecution. And now some 240 years later, we're right back there. Right back there. But what can we expect? Well, we can expect persecution. This brings us now to John the Baptist story. Jesus' activity of sending his disciples out and his own miracle working, well, it has caused a stir in that society. That news of what is going out in Galilee up north has spread even to Jerusalem and throughout Israel. And King Herod hears about it. And rather than being delighted that people are being healed, Demons being cast out. He's threatened. He's frightened. It alarms him. 
And Mark writes this in verse 14, and King Herod heard about it, heard about all these miracles. For this, for his Jesus' name had become well known. And the people were saying, John the Baptist has risen from the dead. And that is why these miraculous powers were at work with him. But others were saying, no, he's Elijah, this powerful prophet from the Old Testament who did mighty miracles. Others were saying, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he kept saying, no, it's John. John, whom I beheaded, has risen. What a, what a crazy theology that is. Talk about reincarnation. That's not the Jewish faith. John, he believed, Herod believed that John had been resurrected or risen and now was in the form of Jesus. He was spooked, is what we would say today. And then in verses 17 through 29, Mark fills us in on the details about how John the Baptist got arrested because he wouldn't keep his mouth shut. He kept saying it was unlawful for Herod to marry his brother's wife while his brother was still alive. His brother was Philip. Philip's wife was Herodias. Herod, in a sense, essence, took her from his brother and married her. And according to Jewish law and customs, it was wrong. And John the Baptist had the courage, talk about courage, to stand up and say it was wrong. Well, Herod didn't like that. And so Herod had John arrested. He's now in a dungeon. And then on Herod's birthday, Herod throws this huge, lavish party. Think of a Roman toga party with all this abundant wine and lavish food. All the bigwigs, the elites in that society are gathered together for a party. And his stepdaughter, Herod's stepdaughter, a girl named Salome, came in and danced for them. And Herod, no doubt in a drunken stupor, made a crazy promise. He said, ask me for whatever you want, and I will give it to you now, even up to half my kingdom. Verse 23. So, Salome, after consulting with her mother, who hated John the Baptist, the girl said, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Verse 25. And so, even though Herod didn't want to do this, he knew how popular John the Baptist was in the eyes of the people. He didn't want to do this. He was forced to. He was stuck because he had given his promise. He had given his word. He had made an oath. So immediately, Mark tells us, he gave the command and they went and beheaded John and they brought his head, this is gross, on a platter to the girl who then gave it to her mother. What a sick twosome they were. How sick and depraved. And verse 29 tells us when his disciples, John the Baptist's disciples, heard about this, they came and took away his body and laid it in a tomb. Jesus, when he heard about it, was saddened. And he went away into the wilderness to mourn with his disciples, who had just returned from their missionary journey of going out two by two throughout Galilee. That's verses 30 through 32. And I want to just share with you Jesus' opinion of his cousin, John the Baptist. On a, another occasion, Jesus said this about his cousin John. He said, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing. That word soft means expensive clothing, fine clothing. Those who wear expensive clothing are in king's palaces. So what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. And I tell you, one who is more than a prophet. Truly I say to you, among those who are born of a woman, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Talking about our resurrection bodies, the future that we all anticipate. But as far as earthly lives here, none greater than John the Baptist. He played a role and he was faithful in his mission all the way to the end. John the Baptist was the first martyr for the cause of Christ, but he certainly wasn't the last. Think of how many countless people 
have been beheaded, burned at the stake, died in prison, killed basically in various many ways because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And they refused to back down. Folks, we know from the book of Revelation how this whole world is going to end. We know that a world order, a global alliance is going to come and it's already assembled right now. We're seeing that. And as it gains strength, there's going to come a day where if you don't give allegiance to the beast, that global alliance, that new world order, and where are the mark, 666, that means give your allegiance, then you're going to be ostracized. You're going to be penalized. You're not going to be able to buy or sell. Folks, that's coming. China's already there. They have a social credit score that if you're not supportive of the Communist Party, they can blackball you from even getting on a city bus. You won't be able to buy or sell. You have to sell your social credit card. And if your score is too low, you're, you're blackballed. That's in China right now. And our country and many countries in this world, I believe, are going to be heading that way. We know that from the book of Revelation, where it's going. That's why we need to be strong in our faith. This is no time for a weak faith. This is no time for a pathetic faith, a casual faith, a lukewarm faith. This is a time to know what you believe, why you believe it, and why it's important. This is a time to draw close to Jesus and live for him and walk with him. Amen, folks? This is a time to be excited about your faith and to stand strong for Jesus no matter what. So what can we expect Well, we can expect growing opposition in a world that's going crazy. We can expect maybe even outright persecution. But we can also expect God's strength, the Holy Spirit's power, day by day and with each passing moment. So don't fret. Don't fear. Don't worry. Trust in the Lord and stand strong with Him. And don't do it alone. It's not you against the world. It's us together. You need to be connected. And that's why in three weeks, we're going to have a connection fair. And if you're not currently connected with a small group of like-minded believers, I want to encourage you to do that. There's strength in that, to pray for one another, support one another, encourage one another. We need that. In three weeks, we'll be having a connect fair where you'll get to meet all the small group leaders and have a chance to find out what day of the week these groups meet and who the, what the curriculum is, whether are they studying. And it's more than just Bible knowledge. It's fellowship. It's community. It's growing together in the Lord. So expect that this September to get connected. We live in exciting times. What can we expect? Well, I believe we're going to see even more the power of God pouring through us as we depend upon Him daily and together. Proclaim the name of Jesus with love, always with love, truth, and and courage. So let's stand together. Let's worship the Lord together. Let's stay faithful together to the Lord. Amen? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time in your word. We thank you that just as you strengthened those disciples in the first century, you will strengthen your people here in the 21st century. And just as they experienced persecution in their day and misunderstanding and even hatred, we can expect that in our day. But rather than being hateful, we choose love. Rather than being deceived, we choose the truth. We stand up for the truth, even if it costs us. And instead of fear, we choose courage. Courage in the midst of fear. I pray that you would strengthen each person here, whatever they're going through, whatever trial, whatever circumstance that they're struggling with, that you would give them victory and strength over it. They would see your hand of power and encouragement and that they would have your provision, your strength, your grace that is sufficient for whatever they're facing. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.